Welcome back to the Rido Law Firm Odyssey and Library channel. Today I'm being joined by Sanjay Dugal in uh, Abu Dhabi, right? Abu Dhabi, mm -hmm. uh, United Arab Emirates. We are really good friends. We go back several years. Um, I think the first time we met, we chat. We were both speaking at an event in Saudi Arabia, a franchise yes. event. And since then, I mean, we hit it off. We're just we we we. Anytime we're in the neighborhood of each other, we'll we'll meet and get lunch or whatever and chat. <laughs> keep he keep up to date right. in the industry um and sanjay's a really great guy he's one of my trusted resources in in the gcc the middle east region there and uh just wanted to to connect with him again and share some of his insights that are really interesting into how franchising is evolving and developing in the middle east so um before we do that i'll just i'll, I'll say if you want to find sanjay so his current firm uh he's a principal at stellar eastern franchise and retail advisory and his website is uh, it's Stellar Eastern, um, yes. right? Yes, yeah, StellarEastern.com. I'll put a link in the uh, in the description here, and also I'll put a little uh, make sure we have a tag on the website or on the um, video for you. But reach out to him if you if you have questions about franchising in the Middle East and want some insight there. He has a long history of helping major international brands enter the Gulf market. Um, and do so successfully and expanding. So he's he's a uh, very knowledgeable guy. He's a top notch um, top notch uh, franchise uh, leader there. That's for sure. So Sanjay, thank you for joining us. I really appreciate you taking the time and sharing your insights. I hope uh, I hope I know we haven't seen each other because of COVID in quite a while. But I hope everything's is going well for you there and getting back to normal, right? <laughs> yes. So first of all, thank you for having me. Um, Skyler, or should I say Rocky? Or yeah, but it's fine. You can call me Rocky. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no worries. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, things are sort of getting back on track. It's been um, it's been an interesting twenty four months. Um, yeah, no doubt. But yeah, things are looking up in the in the UAE and the GCC generally. Excellent. So with that thought, can we jump right into it? The first question I had was in regards to the future of franchising, what's the latest on the ground there in the, the UAE, the United Arab Emirates and Dubai and Abu Dhabi? What's, um, how, how has franchising changed? What do you see happening on the ground there? Okay, so uh, to, to begin any conversation on franchising or on business, one needs to Put it in the context of the past 24 months because yeah uh that is uh that was like the huge elephant uh in everybody's room right now and without Major reference shot. to it um it is you can't do any industry description justice so um more than 24 months ago COVID struck us and it struck us really hard. And, um, and that's something that nobody could do anything about. But I think the response was extremely varied throughout um, the globe. And UAE did do a pretty extraordinary job where that's concerned because, and, and the reason I mentioned this is because where we are right now are, be, are because of the steps that the UAE actually took at the right time. So um, initially, it was all lockdowns, uh, it was vaccination drives, it was doing all the right things, which they did extremely well. And um, in fact, UAE has been, it's, it's considered one of the, the most effective countries in terms of uh, having dealt with uh, COVID one on one. So, um, mm -hmm. so uh, now, what happened beyond that? So with the worst, hopefully behind us, I use the word hopefully, but you know, let's just uh, know, right? let's say hope <laughs> it's kind of a done deal and our worst <laughs> days are behind. After that, the, the government really took the bull by the horns. They, they uh, were extremely proactive and they brought about several changes that would sort of um, counteract the impact of COVID on um, on business in general and the UAE in particular, and they they, they started 
um, new regulations like something called the golden visa. So UAE, as you know, okay. uh, it's 90% expat, approximately 90% expat. And yeah. uh, you have not, there's no citizenship. So you're permanently temporary, even if you're staying here for 20, 30, 40 years. So that, yeah. so generally you're comfortable, but there is always this sense of uncertainty hanging over you. So the first thing they started was uh, starting, they started something called a golden visa, which is a 10 year visa, as opposed to the two and oh, three nice. year visas they have right now. And yeah. they opened it up for a lot of categories. Um, it, initially it was, it was like certain professions like uh, medical professionals and academics, et cetera. But now they've opened it up for a lot of people, um, which is just, it's giving a lot of comfort in terms of, you know, and in, now instead of being temporary, you're kind of semi-permanent and that kind of reflects in the mindset. It also reflects yeah. on the perception um, that people carry about the um, uh, country. So, that's one. Then they uh, allowed 100% ownership of uh, companies. In the past, you had to, right. a partner could only be a uh, 49% uh, owner, and now it's it's 100%. Uh, so that was another rule. They've lowered the is cost that, of doing, sorry? Quick question, is that only within uh, some of the free trade zones, or is that throughout the whole country. Oh, no, this is across the board right now. Right now in wow. UAE, That's fantastic. Um, foreigners can invest 100% in a company and call it theirs. Wow. Whereas in the past, That's the most they could do the was 49%. Um, yeah, that was a huge so, part of, of starting a business was finding the right partner. Exactly, I mean, that's, exactly. In the past, when I've been doing business there, that's always been, it's just the huge first step. It's like, how do you find the right partner and make sure exactly. that you're not going to end up in a bad situation, right? That was a massive um, step. If you if you consider yeah. the, the history of the country and the history of the region, that was a massive wow. step. And they took it um, decisively. They took it proactively because they knew That's that fantastic. Um, you know they're gonna they're gonna have to up their game um, to bring back the former days of yeah. glory or or Stay actually better those days. Um, yeah. And then they, they they held the Expo 2020 in Expo tw in 2021 slash 22 and did an extraordinary <laughs> yeah. job of it. Uh, and Excellent. I think that that you know they 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 showcased their best side to the entire globe and they did an extraordinary job of it. They actually outdid themselves in the, in the way they, they managed the six month event. So that really Excellent. helped. Um, uh, they've also eased regulations um, in, in terms of. So besides this, this hundred percent ownership, there's a lot of things that were that that uh, I won't go into the specifics of, but they would kind of be financially and uh, financially draining and resource-wise they were draining. But now they've actually gotten rid of a lot of that. They've also um, done some reshuffling in the government to make sure that that uh, departments are more agile and uh, more okay. sort of responsive so yeah, yeah all of that so pr pretty extraordinary so so that's where we're coming from it was important for me to emphasize this is because like going forward uh, uh, you know the, the new the, the so-called new normal uh, looks very different for everyone and, it's a new ball game uh, yeah a, 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 a new ball game and a lot depends on so you you couldn't choose the pandemic but you could choose the response and UAE, as always was uh, was ahead of the game, and in in doing all that, and my point there was that UAE created a very conducive environment uh, to business. But the, but realities of business um, are what they are. So on one hand, you have a friendly government and you have friendly regulations. But on the other hand, you you realize that um, things aren't quite the same. Mindsets have changed. Uh, customer behaviors have changed. Customer expectations have changed. Margins, uh, inflationary pressures are on. So UAE, yeah. uh, like rest of the world, is facing inflationary pressures. Um, uh, but you know, in spite of that, they've managed to grow their economy. Uh, in spite of that, they've actually managed to increase their foreign direct investment during the, this this wow. uh, pandemic time. Um, so yeah. that's. A, uh, although there's a, there's a negative GDP growth, obviously, but there's a lot of um, boxes they've actually ticked in terms of 
uh, of what a government should do in terms of, of uh, you know, when, in terms of not wasting a good crisis. Uh, yeah, yeah, no. So you're absolutely correct. That's, um, yeah. and, and they've really taken it, uh, they've really taken it as an opportunity, right? Like you're saying, exactly. in, in being ahead of the curve there, which is fantastic. So you mentioned that some of the costs are changing, some of the consumer uh, tastes or maybe are changing or their preferences. Can you give us a little bit of details about that? What are some of the, the trends that are, are uh, developing or what do you see happening there? What, what are the changes where I know Dubai and Abu Dhabi are obviously are radically different places than they were 10 mm -hmm. years ago mm -hmm. and even and more so 20 years ago. But even just two years ago, there's been some radical changes here in the U.S. and overseas. And I'm sure in, in the UAE, it's the same. Mm -hmm. Can you share some thoughts and observations about that? Yeah. So, um, uh, firstly, there's the, the consumer, as, as much as the consumer would like to believe that things are now gradually getting normal, there is a cautious mindset because a lot of jobs were lost during the pandemic, not sure what's going to happen in the future. So uh, that doesn't mean they stop being consumers, but that means they become more, um, more sort of careful consumers. Uh, that's okay. one. Yeah, a lot yeah. of technology involved. And so especially when you talk about attract food and beverage um, in particular, but uh, retail in general, a lot of technology, a lot of uh, avoidance of one-on-one -on -one contact, if possible. And, uh, you know, the, the pandemic showed them how technology can facilitate that. So they would actually rather continue. Uh, with inflationary pressures, uh, margins are actually reducing. So it, it's, it's extremely important to, to run a, a, a tight ship, a lean and agile um, uh, operation. Now where franchising comes in the picture over here is, so it's interesting when you, when you talk about franchising, the, the, so, okay, before I say, say anything further, I'd like, to, uh, uh, I'd like to mention that a lot of what you say about the UAE is anecdotal. You have to be there on the ground to know what's going on. There aren't that many numbers available in, uh, in terms of being able to share. I think a lot of to, uh, that's got to do with the fact that um, most companies are private and they yeah. don't necessarily uh, share their data. Uh, and whatever data is available, some of it's old, but you get a fairly good idea um, based on like being in the thick of things. That's the best idea in, in terms of uh, some numbers are more precise than the others. So I just wanted to sort of um, qualify whatever I say by, by, yeah, by yeah, mentioning this. Um, so in terms of franchising, a lot of franchisees were actually happy during the pandemic because they didn't have to navigate the challenges of the fran uh, of, of um, COVID on their own. So there's yeah. a lot of, uh, That's a good uh, point. But yeah, so th there's a lot of uh, news out there that they were happy uh, with the franchises helping them with uh, lease renegotiations, uh, with supply chain um, adjustments, uh, with, um, ta uh, with royalty holidays. Um, yeah, getting supplies so there, too for PPE. Yeah, and so stuff. Th there were there were quite a few good things, but these were the fran these were like the franchises that are already there in in the yeah. in the UAE, and generally the bigger guys could afford to actually do that uh, rather than the smaller ones. Now, UAE um, in particular and GCC in general has most of the top tier franchises, whether it's retail, whether it's food and beverage, whether it's health. They're all actually there. So they are there and they will continue. Uh, franchising for the future is only going to get better because a lot of people would like to take control of their own destiny after the, the uncertain events of the past. There's a big but over here. The big but is, but those franchises may or may not be overseas franchises. Yeah. They could be, uh, or or they don't, they they may or may not be American franchises where most of the franchises actually come. Not most of them, yeah. but that's what, you know that's a country you associate with with franchising. The reason being, um, so top tier, all gone. You know we know that the the basic franchise equation, the franchise proposition is equal to an operating system plus a brand equity. Yep. Unless 
And for that, you pay handsomely. You pay five, six percent. You pay sometimes two percent marketing contributions, etc. And you know, these even in the best of times, these do create a lot of strain on the PNL. Right now, unless a franchisor can demonstrate tangibly the value of the brand, because remember, top tier are taken. All the all the the brands where you just put the brand on on top of the people you know, know it at the entrance. And people just walk yeah. in, whether you know the Starbucks of the world, etc. Et KFC. Those are right. pretty much yeah. taken. So if I want to take a tier two brand and I want to pay them six, seven percent, and guess what? That's that might be all that I'm actually making, six to seven percent. Why would I actually do that? Uh, if the recognition of the it might be like five hundred stores in Texas, for example, that's great. What's how does that recognition convert in excuse me in the UAE market? If it's if it's not recognized, those five hundred don't really translate to five hundred in this particular market. So um, and then there's a lot of local competition coming up as well, and and, and a lot of good um, solid franchise propositions that can be sort of accessed locally. So because of all that, I don't see, I see bigger entry, higher entry barriers for um, franchisers who are not totally um, prepared and franchises who in the past used to view the Middle East as, as a seller's market for them where you just come and everybody's hungry for a Western franchise and they're going to invest. Franchising is still considered lucrative, but the average consumer and the average investor is far more informed than before. Plus, there's the reality of the market and the reality of the past 24 months, despite the government support that just doesn't allow the numbers to add up. So if a franchisor from the US wants to come to the UAE, the most important thing they have to keep in mind is that this is going to be a marathon. I know it sounds cliched, but it's it's a marathon. It's not um, a sprint. And what that actually means is be prepared to meet the franchisee halfway, quite literally. Be careful about your uh, uh, fees. Be careful about your demands on locations. Uh, make sure that you, you have that support um, in place, which is specifically for your foreign franchisees. Um, you know, one of the companies I've worked with, one of the major US franchises I've worked with, uh, lost money on its international operations nine years in a row before they actually turned a profit because they were committed to making, to, they were committed to um, uh, supporting their franchisees. And now they're a, they're a great success. But, you know, it doesn't, um, success is no accident. It could never, it, it doesn't Show happen time. just because you want it to. The scale. Uh, so are you willing yeah. to do that? You know, unfortunately, a lot of the overseas franchises are not willing to do that. They are not. Yeah. Because a lot of them come here, not because they want to, because they have to. They've hit a wall domestically and they say, well, where we can, where can we make some quick money from? That quick money doesn't exist anymore uh, for various reasons, for, for uh, economic reasons, for whatever has happened in the past 24 months in uh, and the, and the, the, the robust um retail and franchising environment that keeps on improving by the day locally whether it's here or whether it's saudi arabia of course we're talking gcc six countries but uh the main two are, are, are obviously uh, uae and and saudi arabia yeah so that's a great point uh, oh i'm sorry go ahead go ahead no yeah i'm uh, um, so so we're just saying that it's and th there's also more uh kind of uh, visibility of of concepts from other parts of the world um far east southeast asia uh korea uh, Mal malaysia uh, you know thing countries that you didn't really they, they were not the first countries to come to mind when you thought about franchising when associated uh, uh, all, yeah all that's happening too so um collectively now i i don't but for tier two brands onwards, tier one brands always had that tremendous inherent value. You know, this global recognition yeah. that never comes uh, easy. And once you've built that, then then you 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 are basically in in a, in a seller's market. But those are gone. 
I don't think there yeah. are too many more brands that have global recognition that haven't come to the UAE. That that doesn't mean the franchises have exhausted. There's still thousands of more franchises, but they aren't quite the same as the ones that actually exist over here. Quality and some brand. actually come here and yeah. and even before the pandemic, they came here with certain assumptions. Um, and they they failed. They crashed and burned, and they actually had to go back. So they are wow. And and ten x that now. Uh, you know, in, in terms of what the conditions actually are. The other thing is, you can't exist right now in a small format. You either go big or you go home, because um, in an in an economy like this, you need scale. Without the benefit of scale, it's just not going to actually happen. The other thing is that when a lot of people are, are going in for entrepreneurship, overseas franchises still cannot sell units. They, 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 their best, their ideal vehicle of expansion is um, area development or country development agreements, not even master franchises, uh, because it's just easier. It just makes a lot more sense and it's it's convenient in, in, in many ways. but. There That's are really individuals, a, a lot of yeah. individuals who, you know, franchising was invented for the for the average uh, corporate guy who was fed up of his of his uh, job and said, I want to make a living for myself. So franchising was invented for the individual and then it gradually became corporate in, in the US yeah. uh, in terms of, you know, certain groups over here. It's always been corporate. Yeah. And now and, and they don't know how to sort of trickle that down to the individuals. Hmm. And, uh, and where, whereas that's concerned, uh, the the local franchises, the local franchisors rather, they have a they have an obvious advantage. Even though they may not be as big as some of those brands, they may not have that kind of recognition. But if you have a six, you have to remember one more thing. If you have a six store franchise in the UAE, you might have the same amount of recognition as compared to a five hundred store franchise franchise on the west coast of the united states it's it's all about recognition um then you have guys right next door you don't have the uh, the problem of of um, various problems geographical distance uh, time differences uh, culture differences you don't have all those impeding uh, your communication and impeding business it's a lot a lot um, more seamless that's for sure in communicating yes. now, in yes. regards to homegrown brands it is something that i even yes. started to see a couple of years ago in Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. and in the UAE, oh, yeah. and um, it's only it's only accelerated since I've last visited and I've last seen it. Can yeah. you tell us a little bit about some of these homegrown brands? Not necessarily maybe the names, but in in your observations, is the what is the food quality or like the systems quality, the operations? Are they are, are they real competition? I mean, if not now, I mean, are they reaching that point? Oh yeah, so. Before talking about homegrown brands, I'd like to uh, uh, preface that by talking about the demographics of of the GCC, but uh, uh, UAE in particular, and yeah. Saudi Arabia. Uh, UAE, about sixty five percent of the population is between twenty four and about twenty five and fifty four, and if you add from from zero to um, 25 about 75 80 percent uh saudi yeah. arabia about 15 20 percent below 15. and so without going too much into numbers they have a major major uh young population both of them young smart uh access to the best of education this is where you need to begin yeah. with because then you start understanding uh, the mindset these people are 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 smart, they're well traveled, they're exposed, and they have learned from the Western franchises that came here first 25 years ago. They've actually grown yeah. up on them. Yeah, you're right. And, and they're not that fascinated by them as compared to um, as, as compared to learning from them and as compared to sort of um, deciding what they don't like about those franchises. And this this Good obviously if you right. if you study generations <laughs> Um, Gen Z and millennials, they, they tend to have a, a different sort of approach towards uh, brands and brand loyalty and loyalty is uh, anyways. So you've got a couple of things going on. You've got these guys who actually uh, grew up in this culture. Um, uh, 
and you know at, at, at the same time um, you have uh, these guys who are uh, wanting to sort of put their stamp their own stamp on the markets uh, as compared to sort of just you know letting the old brands actually keep on coming in so uh, my answer to your question is this many of them have done actually an extraordinary job in terms of creating local brands and they have the numbers to prove it they have the social media to uh, to prove it they have um they have the endorsements to prove it uh so it's not as if like you know they you know you, you you always have certain brands where there's hype created and then they fizzle out after some time but um you know i'll, I'll name names i mean i'll give you an example there's there's um there's a brand called uh pickle p-i-c-k-l no e okay um 2019 one unit then came the pandemic but in 21, they have eight units. Um, so when, when they say they want to be 200 stores in five years, you believe them because when <laughs> yeah. somebody can grow from one to eight in 2020 and 2021, um, what is it? Burgers, but fresh fast food, which means um, the meat has no hormones. It has no artificial yeah, yeah. ingredients, et cetera. But at the same time, uh it's fast food so uh you have that you you have um there's a brand called salt s-a-l-t uh salt uh a, a lot of it there are a lot of food trucks throughout the country that bear that name it has a cult following now interesting that may not may or may not be a franchise but it also it, it still exemplifies how locals these are two ua emirati ladies who created this brand and it exemplifies wow. how uh, local individuals are capable of creating quality brands that yeah. can command a major following. Uh, so salt, you know, if you, you ask anybody in the UAE, have you eaten at salt? Um, they've got most places they have 4.5 plus ratings out of five. Uh, they, and they have major fan following, a major fan following pretty much uh, everywhere. Um, That's awesome. You have that, and and then you have uh, street food concepts like Zarub, and you have Operation uh, Filafil, and uh, of course now you know talking about Saudi. I'm sorry, I'm like more focused on the UAE because that's where I'm based, and UAE is still the is quite, yeah. to the broader Middle East. Yeah. No, no question, even though Saudi yeah. Arabia represents a bigger bigger market, um, but from Saudi you have a brand called Kudu, which is um, it, it's again, it's that. a burger chain, 300 yeah. units plus, multiple wow. countries. Yeah, um, you have Al Bayk, I believe you and I have eaten there once, uh, which sort of competes with. Uh, so Al, it's called Al Bayk, Al B A I K. Uh, it's okay, a okay. brand, homegrown fried chicken. Uh, yeah, competes right. with KFC. At one point, they had yeah, more really. stores than KFC in Saudi. Apparently, not now. Um, you have a coffee chain over here called Philly, and he's grown into 50 or 60 units. Uh, he's in North America, he's in the UK, uh, he's in the Southeast Asia, he's in India, he's in the GCC. Within no time, you could go on and on. So these people, um, they've learned from the best. Franchising yeah. was made in the USA. But then, you know, there's nothing stopping you from learning and then actually improving upon that. It's just like... Um, you know, you don't necessarily have to invent a new wheel, but you can always make a better one. And that's what a lot of these guys are yeah. doing. Um, and that, that's so, the sense that I've gotten is that they're taking yeah. the concepts. Um, you know, there's only so many operational systems, right? You could ever invent, I guess, it would make a hamburger, but there's ways to improve yeah. it. There's ways to bake, you know, improved recipes locally and, and make those appealing to a wider audience um, and better ingredients, like you mentioned. And that's right. the sense I've gotten. So you're confirming that. And I'll, and I'll also say that it's interesting to see in the last couple of years how some of these um, local brands to maybe GCC or Southeast Asia and even Africa, I'll say, are starting to grow into Europe and the United States. I think one of the huge success stories that we've seen as well in the industry is Nando's. I've seen mm -hmm. them in the U.S. already. It's crazy, um, which is oh, yeah. it, which people probably wouldn't recognize it just off the street now, you know, but you, you will, you'll get to start seeing it and get to know it, but it's a South African 
Um, I think it's also fried chicken, right? Concept, basically kind of like a KFC. It's, but it's a grilled very chicken. Authentic. It's called peri, peri, peri chicken. And that's so right. That's right. It's very authentic. Yeah, it's very authentic. It's, I think, Polynesian, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, they're doing exceptionally well over here. Yeah. And they continue to grow. Um, oh, yeah. They have at least one yeah. in unit in Chicago, I know. I think I've seen it in New York mm -hmm. as well. But just mm -hmm. traveling around, I see them pop up. I'm like, it's crazy. This was something that only folks overseas would have known a couple of years ago. Exactly. And, you know, dare I say that a lot of these brands are actually beating the Americans at their own game. Because, again, you know, I have to keep on emphasizing this. Franchising was always synonymous uh, with the U.S., but at, at somewhere down the line, uh, some of the franchises like kind of lost the plot, if I may. Like, you know, a few years ago, I wrote an article um, called, um, it was titled, uh, open, An Open Letter from a Gulf Investor to the International Community of Food Franchisers. And I basically highlighted what was missing in their franchise propositions and how they need to up their game if they want to continue the success of the early days. And yeah, somehow yeah. Um, somebody from the IFA ended up seeing it and they sort of they said, you know, they were very emphatically saying, you have hit the nail on the head. So I, I was. It, it's not about like they having read my article, but the fact that uh, they, you know, IFA actually um, strongly uh agreed with what was with the points that were put across and they said this is what we've been telling our franchisors uh yeah. over the years yeah. that you know what got you here will not necessarily get you there and in the end it, it ended up being um published in their franchise world magazine but the point was cool. that uh you know don't keep on trying to do what you were doing when you uh were you know when it was a seller's market those days are yeah. long gone, but right now, it, you know, it's long gone on steroids, meaning long gone, forget, but right now it's, it, it, it's a, it's a different ball game altogether. Franchising is not going anywhere. Of course, we all know that, but in its current form, especially in the traditional Gulf form, uh, franchiser comes to the UAE, a rich family owned company just buys the whole thing, uh, sometimes for prestige, sometimes just because they can. And then things, you know, uh, and, and then things move forward soon enough. Yeah, I, they're either sitting on the brand and not doing anything about it, and you still can't do anything about that, or then they're expanding yep. like crazy. Not happening anymore, for sure. Not happening. Uh, you, right. there, there's, there's too much you're up against, uh, too, uh, too much money or investment at stake, too much local competition, uh, and which is just going to increase. Um, there's a very strong entrepreneurial culture in this definitely um, majority youth a population that will never allow things to to uh, revert to where they were yeah to be stagnant no you're you're correct i see yeah. that i've seen the same yeah. things it's astonishing yeah. And it's not even it's not even necessarily like the local population that is entrepreneurial they are already of course mm -hmm. but UAE and Saudi Arabia, to maybe a lesser extent, they attract entrepreneurs globally, you know, to to, to go and strike it their strike it rich, so to speak, or you know, to, to lay down their roots and to build something. It's what the United States used to be, and, and I guess it still is to some extent, but a lot of that is now regional, right? You don't have to go to the United States to build something and be an entrepreneur. You can now go to places like Dubai, like Singapore. Um, exactly. Maybe even Panama, right? It's different places uh, oh, yeah. regionally in, on in the globe. Um, so yeah, you're 100 percent correct. That that matches my observations as well. And obviously, the IFA has recognized it too, right? <laughs> so your insights. Yeah. So I, so rounding us out, I know we've we've chatted quite a bit here, but I I would like to to finish it out with with your thoughts, your insights on where will future opportunities lie in the GCC. Um, and that could be, I don't know, countries or industry or innovation, whatever you think, you know, whatever you, your thoughts go when I ask that question. And then also, huh. I know we've talked a bit about it already, but just you round out a couple um, major points on how franchisors can prepare for the GCC. Um, yeah, so I'd really I'd love to hear your insights on that. I think that'd be very interesting for our listeners. So. Um... If if I if I were a food franchiser, frankly, and, and if I was not a like a major global name, 
I'd actually press pause for some time, to be honest. There's way too much going on right now. Um, yeah, yeah. There's the existing franchises. There's there's the there's the competition. There's the pressure on on uh, margins. There's yeah. a whole cloud kitchen uh, movement taking place. Deliveries are big, and deliveries, in a way, even though they deliver different food, they're kind of democratizing food because you know in the end it all comes delivered by the same guy to your doorstep. You're just yeah. up against way, way too much. I would actually press pause, to be honest. But if it were other things, education, um, for ex STEM education, for example. Okay. Brilliant. That's it's it's big and it's getting bigger. Um, health. Remember child care was starting to hit big too. Ch child care, um, health care, health care, elderly care, which is kind of com comes uh, oh, yeah. under, uh, um, you know, under health care. Uh, if I was in that field, if I had uh, telemedicine, um, I've actually dealt with some people mm -hmm. who actually, you know, they have they had this remote radiology reporting uh business format wherein you get everything done locally because your local hospital has the machines but because radiologists are very really sort of uh, expensive to employ so you have fewer of them and then it takes sometimes days and weeks to produce those reports but then with yeah. that franchise um the format you can get those reports in, in as less than as as little as one hour to actually 24 hours really really interesting wow. so I would say tele uh, telemedicine, um, beauty, and uh, health. Basically, um, a, a lot of services, a lot of low capex uh, franchises, uh, okay. a, a lot of franchises who are willing to sort of again play the long game, so that they're not asking for massive upfront uh, fees and and high yeah. percentages in, in royalty. Uh, understanding that uh, they're here for a for a partnership to collaborate to co-create rather than just milk. Yeah, milking yeah. is out. There's nothing to milk. <laughs> it's yeah. So you know, if, if I, I would I would I know I'm sorry. Sort of I've mixed up the I've I've mixed the response to uh, your, your your question, but that's the actual mindset. Could you kindly repeat? Um, the second part of your question again. Sure, so, sure. Second part was yeah. um, so. First part was about where opportunities lie, and second was what should franchisors maybe uh, who see an opportunity, how should they prepare? Yeah, and I so, know that's a big uh, question, right? So definitely, yeah, it, can, it is. A, it is a big question. But yeah, so and I and I touched upon sort of um, both of them a bit. Um, so. Uh, you know, the, the opportunities are like the industries that I've actually mentioned, but yeah, so I would actually stay away from food and beverage for a while. I would just stay away. And and that might be a controversial thing uh, to say, because food and beverage is still the biggest um, category in franchising. Yeah. And it's always been. But then how much can you actually take? There is a lot, a lot going on. Extremely and, uh, there's There's a yeah. lot at stake for the franchiser, but there's a lot more at stake for the franchisees too. and. Um, You'll still find the naive uh, investor who would go for something like this, but I think far fewer as compared to before. How are you going to be prepared? Uh, understand that uh, you have to be looking at a larger area to justify stepping in, in, in the current environment because uh, scale is essential. And to achieve scale, you need a, a larger expanse of operations, not necessarily only in the UAE, but beyond. Uh, you, uh, have, you have to be able to uh, gauge your own capabilities and uh, understand whether that's doable or not. You can't sell um, a franchise for the UAE and then expect the guy to open like three units or four units in the next five years. It won't make anybody any money, but uh, yeah. it'll, it'll basically create a classic lose-lose, which nobody actually wants. Um, yeah, yeah. Make sure that you're willing to put the resources in upfront because a lot of franchises like to do this. They, 
they do promise you, and, and I, you know, I'm, I'm talking from firsthand experience, they promise you the moon, but they haven't done anything extra in terms of being able to support their foreign franchisees. It's basically, you know, same guys in HQ, in whichever, you know, whether in Chicago or New York or wherever, and they're supposed to be uh, supporting the, the, the new franchise. It doesn't work for sure, uh, especially yeah. right now. Um, so, you know, I, I would keep that in mind as well. I would also uh, be, now again, this might be controversial, but I, you know, show goodwill, meet them halfway, um, put in, uh, uh, contribute to, to, to the marketing or um, show like, uh, overt gestures of um, of goodwill uh, to you know literally literally put your money where your mouth is and say well I I'm committed to this too because any franchiser who comes to the Gulf, to to the UAE right now is likely not a global name and if you're not a global name the local franchisee is actually paying you to uh, expand your brand so yeah. recognize that build recognize that goodwill that tangibly. You know, a lot of brands have actually grown because of the franchising in markets where they they have little or no recognition, and then because yeah. of that, then later on they they end up sort of being able to sell uh, at a higher price. But then you know the, the franchisee uh, doesn't get that sort of recognition. But now the franchisee is more uh, aware and educated. Uh, first of all, uh, already quite reluctant with a conservative frame of mind, it likes franchising, but but the the, the source is 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 key so franchising is going to increase without doubt but the franchise yeah. proposition is uh is what's key in the franchisee deciding uh, it's evolving to you know what to yeah. invest in yeah i agree and i think those are good things I, what you're mentioning is that yeah. that franchise relationship that structure is evolving and it's not just evolving mm -hmm. in the gcc right it's evolving around the world um, right. You know, in the U.S., it might, we're, might be a little more stubborn <laughs> as an mm -hmm. industry than a lot of other places with that flexibility. But the reality is, is that the way businesses uh, operate and relate to customers, relate to their strategic partners like franchisees, it has changed radically. And right. franchising is, is going to evolve. And what I, what I like about franchise in general and just the industry is that because of that scale, innovative franchisors can be the ones that really jump in and you know take the bull by the horns and and uh completely change an industry it can happen very very quickly because of the scale exactly of totally one day totally nobody's doing that. it the next day everybody's doing it right <laughs> exactly know? and and you know and well, i always tell people that you know there are very few rules in franchising as such like if you if you think about it there, there, okay there, there are a couple of things that that uh, decide whether a business is a franchise or not other than that, as long as it's legal and two parties agree, anything's possible. Because yep. a lot of franchises oh, yeah. will make you feel, make you believe that this is the way it's done. Not yes. necessarily. Yeah. Anything that you, you, party A and party B, as long as they agree, as long as it's a legal business, yep, and, and as long as the you know a couple of criteria are fulfilled, which everybody knows, uh, common brand, fee, etc., you can do it. What's stopping you? Yeah. Definitely. And th that's absolutely true of the international front. Mm -hmm. um, right. In the U.S., we have some regulatory pressures that that do stifle innovation, I would say, um, mm -hmm. because of the disclosures we have to prepare in the U.S. and th in the paperwork. It makes it we're more franchisors are more reluctant to change things because then that changes our whole uh, FDD. Right. We have to change everything that the regulators require us to do. But in franchising, by and large, that's not the case. Right. It is much more flexible. And, I, and that's. That's the way it should be, I think, in a lot of places and, and even in the United States and a lot of franchise systems, because without that flexibility and that innovation, um, you know, and, and it's obviously there's innovation like at the recipe level and maybe even operations. But we need to the innovation needs to come up even a higher level to right. innovating business structures, innovating how regional operations handle it or, or even maybe citywide operations. It's 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 becoming decentralized. And you mentioned earlier you you talked about the democratization of delivery, right, and and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. that trend, in my opinion. I think it's a good thing, and I think I see it happening. Mm -hmm. Is happening beyond just financing, beyond just delivery. It's happening in structure level and how corporations are put together, how the franchises uh, systems are put together in regards to the relationships of the agreements, and that's all a good thing. It's going to be really fascinating to see 
how it evolves. And I think franchising internationally will be at the forefront of that because of all the reasons you mentioned. And right. I think UAE and the GCC are going to lead that because they're savvy investors, because they are well-educated, well-traveled and see things that they know they can do better, they can fix. Uh, they're probably going to be at the forefront of that. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, with that, Sanjay, I really appreciate your insights. Where can folks go to find you if they need some help entering the GCC market and want some uh, counsel and uh, strategy from you? Where where can we send folks? OK, so the, the, the website, uh, www.stellareastern.com uh, or Sanjay, S-A-N-J-A-Y at stellareastern.com. That's my mail. You can find me there. Okay. We'll put we both connect on LinkedIn as well. Um, so any of those would be good. Perfect. I'll put the links to those. Also, you have a book. Uh, I forgot to mention earlier. Um, I'll put a link to your book too. It's it's franchising. Is it in, franchising internationally? Right. Yes, franchising. Uh, yeah. uh, so it is. The the title might sound a bit dated because it says 2021 <laughs> and beyond, but essentially it's timeless. Whereas the GCC is concerned and the Middle East is concerned. Yes, and I read it. I got it last year when it released and I read it. I mean, you can read it in a week or less, you know, weekend if you're oh, yeah. really yeah. <laughs> just yeah, down. Not many pages, yeah. Just... But um, it's very great. It's really great insight. And uh, so, folks, if, if you're interested in entering the GCC or want some counsel on that, that location, that region in franchising or even franchising, a little, you know, in Southeast Asia, he's had his experience a little bit outside of GCC as well. Um, reach out to Sanjay. He's a great, great guy. I work with him. Um, you know, I hope we all be able to, to sit down with them again and get some, some tea and coffee there locally, uh, yeah. early next year. So maybe we'll do another video, uh, from Dubai or Abu Dhabi there. <laughs> so, yeah, look forward to there. that. Yeah. <laughs> but perfect. Well, thank you for joining us, Sanjay. I really appreciate it. And, uh, we'll, thank you. we'll hopefully send some folks your way and we'll touch base in the future. Sure. Take care. Okay. Take care.